keeping you safe. Eleven species. Blue is the last of her kind. You'll never capture her. We thought you might know someone who could help. A rescue op? What could go wrong? Hey, Blue. You know me. Come with me. You know you can't stay here. Back your men up right now. who prove raptors can follow orders. You never thought how many millions of trained predator might be worse? They're a cell. Not blue. They need it for something else. What is that thing? They made it. This is the most dangerous creature that ever walked the earth. I say we shut this whole thing down. Hey girl, you think what I'm thinking? Genetic power has now been unleashed. You can't put it back in the box. If I don't make it back, remember you're the one who made me come here. I'll be all right. These creatures were here before us. And if we're not careful, they're going to be here after. Welcome to Jurassic World. You're listening to 91 Reasons, a journey into the twisted landscape of pop culture. Keep your hands and arms inside the podcast at all times. And now, The Voice, Jeff Tucker. nature that's being displayed here um, staggers. Well, thank you, Dr. Malcolm, but I think things are a little bit different than you and I had feared. Yeah, I know. They're a lot worse. Now, wait a second. Now, we haven't even seen the part where you have to Don't let him talk. There's no reason. No, no. I want to hear a review part. I really do. Yeah, don't you see the danger, uh, John, inherent uh, in what you're doing here? Genetic power is the most awesome force the planet's ever seen, but you wield it like a, a kid that's found his dad's gun. It's hardly appropriate to start hurling generalizations. If I may, um, I'll tell you the problem with the scientific power that you're that you're using here. Uh, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. You know, you read what others had done, and you and you took the next step. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility for it. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, you you patented it and packaged it and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it. You're gonna sell it. Well, I, I don't think you're giving us our due credit. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Hey, this episode may be a little more rambling than usual. Usually when I sit down, I, I've thought about, you know, the angle I'm going to take on things. And I don't normally just sit down and review movies that I've just seen. You know, normally I do really old movies or we look back at films because then I can tell you about the, you know, the experience going to see it and how it's aged over time. But instead, like three years ago, Three years ago, uh, Jeff DePauly, good friend of the show, uh, he approached me, and I didn't really know him at that point. He wanted to talk about uh, the Jurassic World movie because uh, you know I was going to talk about it on the show, and I'm like, hey, yeah, come down. He drove down, and uh, we had a great conversation about it. He enjoyed it, and I, you know, I didn't, but that's okay. You know, you don't have to agree totally on movies. It's just fun to have a conversation about the film. I. You know, my days are taken up with movie conversations and, you know, seeing where it goes. That's I. That's my day. That's how I like to live my life, man. I love talking movies. I can talk movies all day. If this show could somehow become a daily show, 
where we talked about movies and pop culture. I would I, no problem. I could talk about a movie every day. So having Jeff down and getting to know him and his great shows. He does a podcast and uh, talking about Jurassic uh, World. You know, uh, inevitably there was going to be a sequel. And here's the thing. Here's the thing, Jeff. If you're listening, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom is so unbelievably bad that it retroactively made me like Jurassic World even more. And it, that's so funny, right? You're like, life's bad. But now that this has happened, I realize it wasn't so bad. Does that make sense? Jurassic World, at least the, the reason, you know, I, I come, I'm, I'm coming at Jurassic World from a whole different angle because I work at a theme park. So whenever they do theme park stuff on screen, you know, I first off, I'm interested to see how they portray it. And second, I'm just like, that's not how things work. They wouldn't just send guests out willy nilly or not like in Jurassic world, they shut the ride down. Everybody goes home, but they've left those kids out in that bubble. That would never happen. And, you know, in a good theme park, they wouldn't just send you out on the ride. Like if you got on pirates, of the Caribbean and there was an emergency in the park. And when you got off the ride, everybody had left like that's, that's not going to happen. That's just stupid. Well, you know, Jeff, the kids went off the course. No, they would, they would have a tracking on the vehicle and they would never let, a guest vanish into the park. Rule one is safety of the guests above all safety, safety, safety of the guests. So that's an irritating thing, right? But at least in Jurassic world, they, they had a park that was open. You know, there's that fun sequence where the bleachers drop and you can see the, the, the water creature under the water. You know, there's a lot of fun stuff. I love the monorail and all that. This movie, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, I first off, it's made a billion dollars. So what do I know? I must not know anything. You know, I have money problems like everybody else. I, I don't I've never created anything that made a billion dollars. You know, if I had catered Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, and I made a billion dollars. I would take credit. Well, the reason it's so good is because I catered it. I did the craft services. Oh, really? Yeah, you can see my name in the credits. You know, but I've never been involved in anything that made a billion friggin' dollars. Here's the thing. I don't I don't think people even care at this point if the movie's good. I think we've been so accustomed to crap on the screen. Derivative, reboot, reboot sequel redo do over that nobody cares anymore it's just maybe maybe we've reached the point where going to the movies is such a novelty you know now that we have home theaters with netflix and 10,000 choices without having to go to a video store you can just dial up your you dial up you can just log into your whatever you're on your smart tv i use a playstation 4 you can get any movie you want you know I'm very lucky that uh, Handel lets me use Plex because I watch a lot of movies through there. But maybe that's turned the going to the movies like this big novelty for it's got maybe millennials. It's got to be young children, younger millennials. What, what's beyond millennials? I don't know. I have no idea. After a million, there's a billion. So they're bilennials. I have no idea. But maybe they see going to the movies like this big ta-da event. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the movie is as long as you're going somewhere. And listen, I'm guilty of that. I've gone to the movies all the time. Back in the day, I would just drive to the movies. Let's see what's playing. We'll see anything. I will see anything. You know, and that's how I've seen. Like I'm, I could rattle off movies you've never even heard of that I saw at the theater. Um Addicted to Love, um, Three of Hearts, uh, The Vanishing, movies like this, they're blips. They used to be, there used to be movie blips. Not every movie had to make a billion dollars for you to care about it. You know, now if it doesn't make a billion dollars, it's, it's some sort of uh, failure. Look at Solo. Solo had 
relatively decent numbers for a movie that size. The problem is they made it twice, so it cost twice as much. So it needed to do twice as much business just to break even, you know. But I remember going to the movies just to go. Nothing wrong with that. But at least, so you know, the people who make these movies, they have to care. And I've watched a lot. I'm a big fan of Red Letter Media. And there's a thing at the end of one of the Star Wars reviews where Plinkett's like, this guy here, glad to be working. Glad to be working. What are you doing? Glad to be working. What are we making? Doesn't matter. I'm glad to be working. And I think these Jurassic Park movies, everyone's just glad to be working because they certainly have zero interest in making a movie that's either cohesive, makes a lick of sense, or is even fun. And this movie... You know, like a broken clock is right twice a day, which means that even a crappy movie, and we'll go, we'll go to the pinnacle, Phantom Menace. It's a terrible movie. Pod Racing is amazing. Pod Racing will get you back in the theater. I saw Phantom Menace five times on the big screen because of the pod racing scene. I bought the blue, the Blu-ray, uh, the original DVD release because of the pod race scene. So. Even terrible movies can have amazing sequences. You know, I'm not a fan of Tron Legacy, but the light cycle sequence is amazing. So movies can have flashes of brilliance. And Jurassic Kingdom, Fallen Kingdom has a couple of scenes. You're like, hey, that's that's pretty bitchin'. But it's wrapped up in such, oh, such mediocrity that the coolness factor of any of those scenes does not forgive the crap factor of the rest of it. You've got to have a story to hang it on. And I knew when I saw the trailer that Jeff Goldblum's scene would be that courtroom scene and that's it. He's not He's not going to go run through the jungle chasing dinosaurs again. And they book in the movie with him to sort of give it some weight. And here's I've said this on the show. Schlock is okay. Crappy movies are okay. Making a B movie... Is fine. If you want to make a B movie, monster movie, I am all about it. Where young girls scream, boys try to have sex, and then everybody gets murdered before somebody, in a clever way, kills the monster. I am okay with those movies. I have no problem. I grew up on a steady diet of them. The problem with this Jurassic mess is that it thinks it's some big noble affair. It thinks it's doing important work because it's stupid monster B movie stuff is wrapped up in conservation and right to life. Do the dinosaurs have a right to live? Who freaking cares? Are you kidding me? You're going to preach to me while the monsters are running through lava. Oh my God. So the movie sets up. It's been a few years since the park closed and the park is now overrun with weeds and moss. And apparently they built the theme park on an active volcano. Now, I've never been involved directly with planning a new theme park, but I would think that job one would be location, location, location. And you wouldn't build a massive theme because remember Jurassic World had its own airport, its own cruise line dock. It had hotel rooms. It had the park. It had the research facility. Like It's all in one. And they built it on an active volcano. Like that would have been the biggest red flag ever. But okay, again, it's a schlocky B movie. So we'll forgive that part of it and just, hey, Jeff, just go with the movie. Okay, I'll just go with the movie. So then we've got some... Uh, the, the opening of the movie is 10 minutes of a newscast filling us in on the plot. Oh, this is so boring. This is such lazy filmmaking. Um, first off, it opens uh, before the, the news broadcast. It opens with a submarine going down to get the Indominus Rex bone so they can add its DNA to this other stupid dinosaur that they're making, right? And I, I, maybe it's because I have faith in humanity that these movies 
they don't work for me. They don't work for me. The original Jurassic Park is a masterpiece. And it it you watch the movie knowing that, hey, the park itself would have succeeded if Nedry hadn't sabotaged it. He turned off all the, all the uh, paddocks. He turned off all the electric fences. He's the one who sabotaged directly, on purpose, the park. The park didn't just fail. It didn't just all of a sudden, on the day of the test, where Alan Grant and company show up, they didn't just fail by accident on that day. You know, it was sabotaged by Nedry, who thought he would turn everything off, get the DNA, and get out in time to turn it back on so that nobody even knew he had done it. So it's an accident, human greed, that undoes the first Jurassic Park. It shows you that with all their technology, humans are still fallible, right? Well, in the beginning of Jurassic Fallen Kingdom, it's just a series of accidents. You know, the big monster's still alive. They don't close the gates in time. Like, it's just, it's not anybody going, I'll show them. I'll prove to the world that dinosaurs deserve to live. It wasn't like, imagine if the movie, if you've seen this, I don't know. Everybody's seen it, right? I made a billion dollars. But imagine if the movie had opened instead with Greenpeace sabotaging the gate to let that monster out instead of just another galactic accident. And look at the size of that monster. You know, it's arguably, it's the biggest creature they've made in Jurassic Park. It's it's the size of a building, right? So a creature like that, we know from regular science that a lion has to eat so many pounds of meat a day. You know, the animals are machines. They have to keep eating. A great white has to eat so many pounds a day. What does this thing have to eat every single day just to exist, right? It would be long dead by the time anybody got to it. The amount of fish that this thing has to eat would have been its undoing. It's just not logical. I know a movie about dinosaurs back to life, we shouldn't be applying specific human logic, right? But the difference is that Jurassic Park, the original film, when they show you how they made the dinosaurs by finding the bugs trapped in amber who had sucked the blood of the dinosaurs to get the dinosaur blood, it all seems really plausible. You watch it and you go, well, that, that the, the beauty and the brilliance of Crichton's book, and I remember getting the book the day it came out, knowing the movie was coming and going... I got to know how he gets the dinosaur DNA. And when it's finally revealed, you're like, that is brilliant because it sounds so logical, you know? And I'm sure Michael Crichton, if he were alive today, would gladly take the checks for these movies, just like John Carpenter takes them for Halloween. Use that money for good. Use that money for your family. Use that money to fund your own projects. I get all that. But I don't think he'd be happy with his amazing book being turned into just some another stupid monster on the loose nonsense, right? And the biggest crime that this stupid movie commits is that the trailers make it look like they're going back to the island to save all the dinosaurs, you know, because it echoes 97's Lost World. Right, which is a flawed film, but again, has some amazing sequences. The sequence with the RV going over the ledge is amazing. When they're falling on the glass and it's cracking, fantastic sequence. Right, but (laughs) if you're going to remake movies, I don't know if Lost World's the one you remake. You know, where it ends with the dinosaur running through San Diego is completely illogical. I don't know. So it's been a few years. Claire, played by Bryce Dallas Howard, is running some conservation coalition to save the dinosaurs. You know, she's been ousted as the head of the company and she's now starting from scratch and they have to get all these people to agree to vote for the dinosaurs to be saved. 
or not saved, you know, and of course, some rich somebody muckety muck comes in and he's got to foot the bill, save all the dinosaurs, but they need Owen because, and this is a very important plot point, Blue, the raptor that Owen can talk to and has tamed, is the last raptor left, right? So she has to convince Owen and she finds him building a house and they have a beer. And at the end of the the last film, you got the idea that they were together because they have a kiss. And then at this one, they're not together. And she's like, well, I threw you out. And he says, no, I left. And you're like, you can't will they or won't they if they already had. It's only will they or won't they when they won't and don't. But not when they already have. Who cares? Are they getting back together? I I could care less. I don't care. But you know he's going to go because in the commercials he's on the island. So there's not really any tension there at all. You know, well, you know, uh, we got to save Blue. Oh, I got to save Blue. Okay. So they end up back on the island. And... There's still souvenirs standing up on tables, which is lame. You know, it's been years. This thing should be completely overgrown, you know, completely rotted out. And they're going to round up the dinosaurs. It's very similar to Lost World. Instead of Pete Postlewaite playing the big game hunter, it's uh, Ted Levine, the guy who played Buffalo Bill. And he's collecting dinosaur teeth and a necklace. Whatever. And we get the sequence where Owen finally has to go out to get Blue alone because they're tracking. That's why they need Claire to activate the dinosaur trackers, right? So Claire and this tech guy are in a, a facility where they're activating the tracker. Owen's out to get Blue. And uh, right when he is about to get him, they tranquilize Blue. It's it's very similar to Lost World. It's the same exact sequence. Um, there's a lot of callbacks to Jurassic Park and Lost World, which, you know, I, I guess those have to be in there. But I, keep them to a minimum. And some of them are just lame. You know, there's one where the little girl, and we'll get to the little girl, is in a dumbwaiter. And it's the exact shot from the kitchen where she fakes out the raptor and he hits the wall, right? So the dinosaurs are being loaded up and then Claire and the tech guy get attacked by some dinosaur and there's lava falling everywhere. And, you know, um, we've watched lava for real in, in on Hawaii. You know, you, it's hard to get near it because it does give off a lot of heat. So you're watching the sequence and it's a gorgeous sequence. It looks beautiful. The lava looks great. But you just know that like they would burn up. They would, you don't have to put your hand in the fire to get burnt. You just have to be too close to it. And this thing's snap, snap, snap. And again, it's a fun action sequence that ultimately doesn't go anywhere. You know, they end up uh, locking it away to get, I guess, burnt alive by lava. I don't know. So then there's a problem with Blue where Blue's been, uh, in, been shot. So they have to pull the bullet out and give Blue a transfusion of blood from a T-Rex. So they have to... uh, This all takes place on a ship because the dinosaurs have been loaded into helicopters and ships and now everybody's leaving because the island is just on its... It's it's done, right? So there's a sequence where Claire has to drive a truck off a dock, fly it through the air, and then land in in the ship and then stop, right? And she does that but none of the bad guys even give her a second look. They just go, oh, you made it. Like, nobody goes, what the hell are you doing? You could have killed us all by jumping that truck. Are you out of your mind? No, they just go, oh, yeah, you made it. Oh, cool. Like, a uh, clipboard, they check off. Truck two arrived. So, we have another fun sequence. And again, I'm giving it credit where credit's due. The sequence where they have to get the T-Rex blood is fun because the T-Rex is asleep. They're riding on top of it. Are they going to get the blood and get out? It's a fun little sequence. They get locked in, right? Um, there's a, a, a woman a scientist uh, who, who takes care of the dinosaurs. And there's a really bizarre moment where the big game hunter 
is having an argument with her and calls her a nasty woman. And it's supposed to be a Trump reference. And I just wonder, like, what are you doing? When you made this movie, maybe that reference was fresh. But, like, are we at a point now where the bad guy now has to be he has to emulate the president to be a bad guy. Like, can't we just have a movie about dinosaurs? Can't it just be about dinosaurs running amok? You know, they have the best laid plans. They're going to get the dinosaurs and do something with them. And then the dinosaurs get loose. There's your movie. But we have to have all these weird subplots. And the weirdest subplot is all. Okay. So the movie then, this is, we, we've gone through an hour. And then the movie completely shifts gears to a different movie. Do you ever see Dusk from Dusk Till Dawn, where the first half is this amazing crime heist movie? And then if you leave at the wrong time and come back in like my friend Trent did, it's a vampire movie. And it doesn't ever tell you that it's that this is going to happen. It just happens. So <laughs> the movie goes from this giant action set piece with the, the the ball falling off the cliff and dinosaurs plunging to their death in the water and they have to get out of the, the ball before they drown and then, then jumping of the truck and then uh, the T-Rex head and they're going and then all of a sudden we end up at Wayne Manor where there's this guy, this this rich guy who we're told funded all of John Hammond's research. He's never been mentioned in any movie or book, nothing. He's just, he's the guy with the money. Oh, okay. And he's got a granddaughter. And he's also got this evil corporate guy because we're still in that place where evil corporate guys are the bad guys. You know, it's not enough that the the dinosaurs want to eat everybody. But there has to be somebody then exploiting the eating machines. You know, it's King Kong. It's not enough to have King Kong. We have to have the guy who wants to put Kong on stage and show him as the eighth wonder of the world. I get all that. That's that's where you get drama from. But this guy is straight out of a Republic serial book. Like, he's the villain of all villains. The only thing missing is a big mustache of him going, I got the dinosaurs. So, he's going to have an auction to sell off all the dinosaurs. God only knows what it costs to get all these dinosaurs off the island. Maybe 10, 30 million dollars. You know, they got a ship, all these soldiers, equipment, people died. You got to you got to pay for that. But he's going to have an auction where these people are going to use these dinosaurs for big game hunting or some sort of research. I have no idea. And they've also got a special dinosaur that they've made out of the Indominus Rex and a Velociraptor. So now the conceit of the stupid theme park movie was that people want a bigger, better attraction, so we have to make it. It's not enough that we have regular freaking dinosaurs. We now have to make our own dinosaurs that the world has never seen and crossbreed them. And instead of coming up with a new idea... They did the Return of the Jedi route, and now we have another super Death Star dinosaur hybrid that's even worse than the last one. Oh, I'm sure that's going to work out well. And this one is going to be used as a military weapon because you can aim a laser at something and then fire off a sonic sound, and the dinosaur will then kill whatever the laser was pointing at. But if you were pointing a laser at something you wanted to kill, you would just shoot it. I, why would you keep a dinosaur? You're going to have a, like, like the military is going to be the Flintstones. Where, you're like, come on, everybody, we're going to war. Send the dinosaurs. Hey, Fred, we're sending the dinosaurs. What? What kind of military is this? We have sonic weapons that can knock you out without any visible ray or tracer. Like, we have weapons that can knock you out. We have submarines and planes that take off straight into the air without a runway, but we need a dinosaur that has to be fed 600 pounds of meat every day. Like, it, this movie's just... The worst insult you can give it is that it's just stupid. Everything they do is stupid. And you're left in... The, you're sitting in your chair going, 
I paid for this. Somebody wrote this. I will sometimes, on my writing, I will sit and agonize for hours to make sure that things add up, that they make sense, that things aren't a galactic coincidence, that it really does hold up under scrutiny. These people don't care. All they care is, is the dinosaur running and eating somebody or knocking something over? And does Chris Pratt have a quip to say? I mean, that's it. And Chris Pratt does his best. He's a good actor. He's great on screen. He has a lot of charisma. He is holding this movie up single-handedly because nobody else is helping. There are numerous scenes where somebody is killed because the dinosaur's tail hits something. The dinosaur didn't mean to do it. It's just turning around. And I'm sure in the writing room, they're like, yeah, the dinosaur turns around and his tail hits the elevator. So the elevator comes back and you're like, that's it. That guy died because an accident. Can we come up like something else? At least in Lost World, the bad guy who has tormented the T-Rex baby the whole movie ends up in the T-Rex lair as food for the baby. It's poetic justice. This movie is just somebody does something and then they get killed. It's another movie where we have to, like the uber rich are the bad guys. We don't know how they got their money. We don't know if they inherited it. We don't know if they got their money by curing cancer in some country. We don't know nothing. All we know is they're in a tuxedo and they're bidding on a dinosaur for some reason. So we must hate them. It's that scene in Last Jedi where Rose is like, these are the people who supply military arms to do the rebels and the Imperials. And I hate and I want to kill them all. And you're like, I don't need class warfare in these movies. Just tell good stories. They're all rich and they're bitty. I would like to have a martini and bid on a dinosaur. Does that make me an evil person? Maybe I just want a compi as a pet. You know, little tiny ones. <laughs> but instead, of course, there's this accidental dinosaur that can butt its head that frees Owen and frees everybody. The one dinosaur single handedly accidentally freeze everybody. So everyone's running amok. The dinosaurs are running loose. The auction has been ruined and the bad guy's trying to get out with the um, Indominus Rex bone for some reason. Like they've already made the monster. You don't need the bone. You need a drop of that monster's blood to replicate it. Right. And that monster. Oh, it's so dumb. It has the ability to get hit with a tranquilizer dart, pretend to conk out, smile at the audience, wink, and then eat the guy, and then the tranquilizer has no effect, as if it didn't happen. Let that sink in, as if it didn't happen. He doesn't ever at any point get groggy. He just, it, it doesn't affect him at all. So then there's a lot of cat and mouse with Owen and Claire and the little girl, and there's some weird, like the, the old man, James Cromwell, the the, move, the money funder guy, uh, he gets smothered with a pillow because he's going to blow the whistle on everything. Like, blow the whistle on what? You're the one who built the lab in your basement. And apparently you built an auction house. Like, you didn't know this was going on. You couldn't just go check downstairs once. He gets killed with a pillow. And the, the pillow scene... You don't see it on camera, but he's talking about calling the police and the bad guy looks at a pillow. You know exactly where it's going to go. And that's the moment where I said, well, you can't then use that these are kids movies as an excuse for your idiocy. Because most kids movies don't have a smothering death in them. Most kids movies don't have a guy killing a guy to take. I mean, then you kill him and then what? He's got a will. The money has to go somewhere. You don't automatically just get it. I, it's so stupid. Characters do things without thinking. And then for no reason at all, I swear to God, no reason at all, the little girl is revealed to be a clone. 
that the little girl originally the real one and her mom died i think in a car wreck or something and she's a clone but it has no bearing on the plot i can only think that there must be there must be a half hour or more of this movie of just exposition cut out because when they revealed that i was like what does that have to do with the plot she's a clone i don't understand so then the lab gets screwed up, cyanide gas is going everywhere, and the dinosaurs are all herded into one room. So, okay, this is very important. The dinosaurs are herded into one room while we debate whether or not to open the door to let them out or they'll all die. It's one room, ladies and gentlemen, one room. How big is that room? Does it matter? Does it matter? Because when the clone girl ultimately opens the door and says, they just want to live like me. Okay, what? So she's only there to open the door to show you that even a clone person, thing, animal has feelings and has a soul, whatever. But all the dinosaurs are let loose. And then we juxtapose that with Jeff Goldblum's speech about Welcome to Jurassic World. So apparently that single room of dinosaurs now is going to populate the earth with dinosaurs. That's like me flushing a goldfish down the toilet and expecting it to revitalize the species. Come on. It's as if they just, they think we don't, we're not watching the movie. I don't, we're not that stupid. And then there's an extended sequence of Blue where Owen's trying to get Blue to go in a cage and Blue's like, F that. And you can actually see him. He goes, F that. And he runs off. It's the same sequence from, you ever see Repo Man? Where Emilio Estevez is about to go into the sky with the aliens. And his girlfriend goes, what about us? What about our relationship? Aren't you going to stay on Earth with me? And he goes, F that. And he gets in the spaceship. You see Blue go, F that. And Blue runs off. And then you see Blue like, looking out over a housing complex, which I don't know what that means. Is Blue going to find a home like E.T. where a kid hides Blue in his closet? Or is Blue going to eat people or what? Because here's the thing. You were very clear at the beginning of the movie that Blue is the last raptor. So the Blue can't populate the earth with raptors if he's by himself. The movie you can't the movie wants to have it both ways. It wants to make these profound uh, uh, statements about nature and life, but then it doesn't want to actually believe in nature and life by having, you know, another Velociraptor to mate with because the female would kill all the other I mean, isn't that what happened in the first one? The female killed everybody but the couple she liked. Well now we've only got one. And that's not even counting the sequence where Claire gets a claw on her leg and ha can't go anywhere. So she kisses Owen and you're like, are they together again now? Or does this woman just use kissing as a way to get what she wants? Like she kisses him. And it's like, well, now we're together. Well, no, you're nuts. Owen's nuts. She's nuts. The last thing these people need is to be together. They need to be as far away from each other as possible. They have done more damage to the planet. They're responsible for more murders than Michael Myers. <laughs> you know, these, forget Claire and Owen being heroes. They're villains. The minute he got Blue, he should have killed Blue before Blue had a chance to kill anybody. She opened a theme park where at least 100 people or more died. Her assistant was eaten up by a monster. You know, these people have to be held accountable. Everybody involved with Jurassic Park or Jurassic World, the park, should be in jail. Every, you know, forget the ooh-ah nature because apparently we're not into that anymore. Now it's just running and screaming and dinosaurs with big claws and the sequence where they're on the roof just goes on for days. And there's a weird moment where Claire uses the laser on Owen and you're like, is this, I don't, I don't know what, I, what, I, what am I supposed to do with this? 
You know, maybe if she had pointed the laser on the ground and the dinosaur, whose only job is to follow the laser, then jumps to its own death. You know, I've always said on this show, the best deaths of villains are when the villain is undone by the very thing he was trying to do. You know, in the Pink Panther, it's the vanishing uh, ray. You know, Herbert Lom is undone by his own ray. The Emperor is undone by Darth Vader, the monster he made. You know what I mean? Like, the, the best villain deaths are a comeuppance. Where you go, if he had just stayed in bed that day and didn't do that thing that is now killing him, he'd still be alive. But we don't get any of that in these movies. People just get eaten by dinosaurs. And they're not clever. I mean, at least not clever like Lost World Way. Like, the one hunter guy is trying to get a tooth. But you should only get a tooth from dinosaurs that you've killed, right? They're trophies. No, he's just going to take a tooth. He's going to tranquilize it and take a tooth. He's like a big game dentist. Stupid, stupid, stupid. You know how people are always talking about the Kardashians and how we have to stop letting stupid people get famous? We have to turn our backs on these movies. It finally happened with Transformers. It only took, what, five of them? Before people stop going? So they have to start over. The new one is a Bumblebee movie. It's not even a Transform. It's not Transformers. It's Transformer. And they're trying to rein it in because we're done with this. And Jurassic Park as a franchise is done. The next one is what? We're going to have dinosaurs running through Santa Monica. And now they we have to coexist like it's Dinotopia. We have to live with the dinosaurs now. They own half the planet. No, if 30 or 40 dinosaurs got loose, the military would round them up and kill them all within a day or two. I don't know what planet these movies take place on where there's no military. The military would just show up and kill them all. Hell, even a cop, a regular beat cop could take down a dinosaur with a big enough gun. But they don't take that into account. It's just people. Oh, there's a dinosaur. It's eating our dog. We should call we should should we call the police? Oh no, no, no. What? Stupid, stupid, stupid. Everyone in that movie theater is dumber for having sat through this pile of crap. This is a movie that deserves to be forgotten like a lot of big summer pieces of crap. It needs to take its place alongside Speed 2, Blues Brothers 2000. What else can we put it next to? The Phantom. Uh, Let's see. There's a lot of big movies that come out that are just crap. Put this one right next to Men in Black 3. Hell, Men in Black 2. Movies that are just, just made to be products. They barely entertain you. They entertain you in a way that a lava lamp does, where every few minutes something cool happens, but ultimately you're going, why am I watching this? There you go. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom is the movie equivalent of a lava lamp, and it's time to unplug it. Hey, we're going to be at uh, Midsummer Scream at the end of this month at the Long Beach Convention Center, July 28 and 29. We cannot wait. It's our favorite convention of the year. We hope you join us. Uh, Get tickets at midsummerscream.org. Use code 91reasons for a discount while it lasts. Um, We're going to be selling time boxes. uh, Five bucks each, cash only, because the internet in the Long Beach Convention Center doesn't work at all. So if you're going to Midsummer Scream, stop at the ATM, get yourself some cash, because it's very difficult to charge credit cards in there. Our time boxes are only five bucks, and we're even going to have the Maggie cutout from Possessed to take pictures with. Uh, We can't wait to go. I'm on three panels. The first one I'm on is the Not Scary Farm panel on Saturday, where we're going to reveal something to the fans. I'm not sure what. I'll also be on the 30th anniversary of the Elvira Mistress of the Dark movie panel. It's going to be me and Cassandra Peterson talking movies. I love it. And then on Sunday, me and Gus Kruger are going to be talking Trapped Year One 
uh, from Not Scary Farm, even though the maze is not coming back, we are going to show for the first time ever a video walkthrough of the maze. Uh, no one's seen it, but a handful of people. I cannot wait to share it. It's going to be so much fun. Uh, Midsummer Scream is a blast. Like I've always said, people who love Halloween, monsters, and horror movies are the nicest, coolest people on the planet. And spending two days with them is an absolute treat. I cannot wait. We will see you at Midsummer Scream. Look for an episode uh, with the whole entire Tucker family talking about Midsummer Scream uh, probably next week uh, since it's coming up the week after. So we cannot wait and we'll see you at Midsummer Scream. I'm Jeff Tucker. This is 91 Reasons. Thanks for listening to 91 Reasons. Please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. Find us on Facebook. Is anyone even still listening? So what makes you oh. nervous? Oh, oh, I think I can fix it. I don't know. There's a giant can on my face that makes me kind of nervous. What else? Um, what if it hurts? What if it hurts? What if what hurts? What if the video, what if, what about the video? What, I don't know. What, what if it doesn't turn out right? Or what if, what if it does get released and people don't like how I did in it? And, and I get yelled these? at. Oh my god. Uh, um, uh, I don't know. It will be on out night. <laughs>